Totena Tato Katoa, Namihi Mahana Kia Koto, Namanuhiri Kua Tai Mai Ne. No Mai Haidi Mai Ki Tene Webinar Tuatahi Na New Zealand Family Violence Clearing House. Ko Nicola Payton Taku Ingoa, He Kai Mahi, Mo New Zealand Family Violence Clearing House. Ko Robin Dixon Aho, He Ko Fokahari, Mo New Zealand Family Violence Clearing House. No Nera, Tena Koto. Tēnā koutou, tēnā rā tātou katoa. Good morning all, and a very warm welcome to this, the first ever New Zealand Family Violence Clearinghouse webinar. I'm Associate Professor Robin Dixon, I'm one of the co-directors of the Clearinghouse, which is your National Centre for Family and Whānau Violence Research and Information. And I'm Nicola Payton, the manager of the Clearinghouse. We're very lucky to have Professor Leonie P. Harmer presenting today. Leonie will speak to us about the most recent issues paper, which she wrote with Nairobi Cameron and Rihi Tanana, on the historical trauma and whānau violence. Leonie is a mother of six and a grandmother, and she is a leading kaupapa Māori educator and researcher currently. She holds the position of Professor of Māori Research at Ngā Wai Tetui Research Institute at Unitech and is the Director of the Māori and Indigenous Ad Analysis Limited, a kaupapa Māori research company. Thank you, Leonie, and I, I, it's my pleasure to hand over to you for your presentation. Welcome. Kia ora. Uh, tūtahi E hui hui mai nei i nonga i tēnei ipirangi, i tēnei ata, um, mai nga tōpito o te ao, uh, uh, hui i tēnei motu, uh, tika Māori me te wai paunamu o Aotearoa nei tēnei te mahi atu uh, ki a koutou uh, i tēnei ata. Kia kōrua, uh, naka rāwa kō Robin, i mahi tēnei ki a koutou o te Family Violence Clearinghouse, um, nga kōrua i whakatū i tēnei, i whakariti tēnei, Ahotanga i tēnei ata, no reira tēnei te mihi, uh, o te tahi mokopuno te maunga tītohia me te awo waikato uh, ki a kōrua, ki a koutou katoa i huihu mai nei, tēnā koutou. Um, I, I really want to start um, with talking a little bit about myself in terms of uh, where I come from, and I, and I do want to premise this with um, you know, talking to 150 people who I can't see. Uh, and so there is a, you know, uh, there is some difficulty in that. Um, so I'm really um, trying to focus in on moving through this presentation in a way that's going to work for those of you who are receiving this. Um, but firstly, it's really important for me to, you know, talk about where I'm from uh, and to give you some kind of indication of I guess what we call my positionality, but particularly my own whakapapa and connections um, here as a Māori woman. So, no Taranaki, no Waikato Aho, uh, Kwaku Iwi, uh, Ko Tiatiawa, Ko Ngati Mahanga, Ko Ngā Mahanga Atairi. Um, I tipuake au i raru i te maunga tito here, i rongi te whenua tapu o Waitara. Uh, I nāi a tonu nei kei te noho au i Ngarua Wāhia, um, i rongi tēnei whenua o tāku o Waikato Tainui. Um, so ko Taranaki, ko Kario i ngā maunga, ko Waitara, ko Waikato ngā awa, ko uh, ngā tai o rehua, ko Whaingaro ngā moana, um, Ko te ati awa, ko Ngāti Mahanga, ko Ngā Mahanga Taere, ngā iwi, ko Ngāti Rāhi de Tōku Hapu, a nei te tahi mokupuna o te maunga e mihi atu ki a koutou. Um, <clears throat> so, I originate um, from, from Waitara, uh, and for those of you who have been um, seeing the uh, Te Pūtaki o Te Liri, uh, discussions and commemorations this week, uh, that was held in Waitara uh, on Monday through to Wednesday as a commemoration not only of the uh, wider uh, land wars within Aotearoa, 
and the impact of that has those historical trauma events on our people, but also in the context of what has happened in terms of the disposition uh, of land within Waitara and the invasions that happened within Taranaki. Um, so I, a lot of where I come from in this work really has to do with my own background, my own whakapapa connections, my own connections to land and place and the ways in which my own Fano, uh, our Fano experienced that, both in Taranaki and also in Waikato. Uh, and you'll see on the screen uh, images of the maunga of, that I connect to, um, of Taranaki and Karioi, of the um, one that I connect to uh, in terms of uh, Waitara, but also in terms of Whaingaroa and the Awa, um, both both are whether I connect to Waikato and Waitara. So that really kind of locates um, who I am and where I'm coming from. So this work grew from uh, a project um, within an HRC program that was led by uh, Cheryl Smith and the Fano at Te Atawhai o Te Ao Research Institute in Wanganui. It was the first health research program that was ever held by an iwi-based organisation uh, and it was called He Kōkono Whare. It was grounded on the whakatauke um, He Kōkono Whare e kitea, He Kōkono Ngāko Kāri e kitea. So the corners of a house are visible, <clears throat> but the corners of your heart or your soul uh, are not are invisible, so they're not seen. And so that whakatauke reminds us of um, having an awareness of things that are happening for people both individually and collectively that we can't see. So the impacts uh, in this case of historical trauma, intergenerational trauma, uh, both individual and collective experiences that we can't see visibly um, when we look at a person in the way we can see visibly uh, um, inside a house but uh, to always have an awareness that these uh, things are often present for people that we're engaging with uh, or in relationship with. Um, <clears throat> the pro project that we uh, were a part of was on looking at historical trauma and violence, and that's continuing uh, at the moment through another EMB project we're doing, He Waka Eke Noa. Uh, and uh, key researchers, community researchers that were a part of the team alongside myself. I was Ngāropi Cameron from Tutama and a farmer from Tutama Wahino Taranaki, uh, Miriana Pittman, of which many of you are aware of her work in Ngāti Kahunganga, and across the country, and Vihi Tinana from Kakariki um, uh, Consultants, uh, who's based in Auckland. I wanted to do a quick overview of the um, seminar. It kind of aligns to the paper. I'm, I am assuming that people have read the paper, um, so I don't need to go into too much depth in terms of all of the parts of the paper. But I did want to touch a little bit on um, <clears throat> some of these key areas, traditional practices, definitions of historical and colonial trauma, the connection of that in terms of colonization, and make some points around their um, impacts in terms of whānau violence, and then look a little bit about some of the barriers that affect and impact on our um, capacity to really implement the type of a Māori approaches uh, in this field. Um, and talk a little bit about some of the type of a Māori definitions and Māori definitions that relate to notions of trauma and violence. Uh, and then finish off with kind of following up around where we're going to uh, from here. Um, <clears throat> So starting with really an idea around uh, a general definition of historical trauma to kind of lay a basis or a foundation for how we move through, the, I move through the presentation. It's really come from um, the work of uh, Yellow Horse and Braveheart, um, who did a lot of early definitions around historical trauma for indigenous peoples, particularly within the Lakota communities. And so uh, historical trauma is understood within that work as the cumulative emotional and psychological wounding over the lifespan and across generations emanating from massive group trauma experiences. So um, as a general definition, I just kind of want us to hold that there and I'll come back to other definitions 
a little bit later on. Um, but that's really the kind of general overview in terms of how we think about historical trauma and how it's been talked about in relationship to uh, native communities. Um, <clears throat> one of the things around historical trauma kind of theory and practice approaches is really to begin with ideas and understandings of what happened and how we operated and how we lived and practiced and valued uh, things within our lives as collectors prior to the events or prior to colonization. Mm -hmm. And so in Native material and Native work, Native American work, people will talk about original instruction. What were the original instructions that communities held that grounded their understandings, practices, protocols, ceremonies, values, prior to this impact, this traumatic cumulative impact on their communities? And so for us here in Aotearoa, and it's work that many people have been doing for a very long time, it is about remembering, reclaiming, revitalizing our own tikanga, so our own understandings and practices, uh, uh, and protocols around how we do things, our own values, our mātauranga, our knowledge as Māori, as whānau, hapu and iwi, and as Māori collectively, um, and te reo, our language. And both our language uh, as an Indigenous language, as the Māori traditional language of this land, original language of this land, but also te reo in its meaning as voice, so how we give voice to that language and how we understand that. So the paper itself, I really, um, <clears throat> we began with talking about those things, that prior to colonization, um, we lived collectively as whānau, hapu and iwi within particular structures and systems that traditional knowledge, our tikanga, uh, indicated and determined the way in which we formed relationships the way in which we maintained relationships, the values that we had, the organisation of communities. And that whānau um, traditionally was organised primarily, well, was, was organised around whakapapa. So um, whakapapa connections, our cultural template for genealogy and our connections to each other were also our connections, as I said in my pepeha, to our land our connections to our waterways, to our seas, to our mountains, to our lakes. And, and those pepeha are really determined by how we locate ourselves as whānau uh, in wider extended family relationships, hapu uh, in terms of subtribal or clan relationships, and iwi in terms of a larger organisation of collectives of whānau and hapu. Um, <clears throat> So it's really important in thinking about historical trauma in any way, uh, but particularly in terms of family uh, family violence and the impact of that, is to remember, to remember the strengths and the, the power of the tikanga that we had in place traditionally uh, and that should still inform us today to maintain the relationships that we had to each other uh, between groupings and to everything that surrounded us, to our relationships, to our entire environment. And so I just put on the screen uh, just five things, five key areas that kind of relate to that mana atua, mana whenua, mana tangata, mana wahine and maudiola. And so what these do is they, they remind us as concepts of our relationships spiritually, uh, and the centrality of our spiritual relationships, uh, both uh, within the ways in which we interact daily uh, in this world, but also our relationship to our ancestors and to those goddesses and gods or deities, those who utter, who provide a spiritual essence for us in all parts of our environment and our lives. Um, and we have many words for atua, but one of the things I think in terms of when we think about the mana atua, I'm not talking about thinking about a singular monolithic God as is articulated within a Christian uh, framework. We're talking about multiple relationships to spiritual guardians and beings, um, 
and connections that uh, go across every part of, of our lives and every part of our environment. Um, and within Te Ao Māori, we have always had uh, multiple spiritual connections in terms. So, for example, when we speak about the earth and we speak about Papa Tuanuku, there are a whole range of atua that are associated also with Papa Tuanuku. So that's something that we didn't write a lot about in the paper, but it's a part of kind of, you know, when we're looking at historical trauma and we're looking at um, that reclamation of knowledge, these are things that we all need to be reclaiming. Um, and we all need to be coming to understand. Mano whenua in terms of our relationship to the land and to our tribal territories in particular, but also the kinds of respect that we give when we're living on other people's land. Um, mana tangata in terms of the, the mana that is inherent to humanity and human beings, and tangata being people. Mana wahine, specifically uh, the relationship in terms of Māori woman and the place of Māori woman. And remembering that is really important uh, in any context because of the impact of colonial belief systems around gender and the diminishing of the status of Māori woman. Uh, generally within society, uh, but also the impact of that within our own whānau. And Māori order is a concept around an aspiration for well-being, and that the way in which tikanga operated uh, for our people and really needs to inform how we operate today is fundamentally in essence about well-being, about ensuring uh, ways and pathways to Māori order, to a sense of well-being. Uh, for our people. Um, and so I selected a quote, which is not in the paper, uh, from one of our kōrāua uh, from um, Taranaki, Huirangi Waikere Puru, and uh, where he talks about mana and modi, and the relationship of mana and modi to our well-being. And what he's saying is that we, we must have an uh, you know, remember the, and recognise and acknowledge uh, the relationships between all living things, between uh, people, between atua, between land, uh, and that everything has modi. Everything has an inner sense of being and everything has a life force. So if we think about modi in more general terms, in terms of life force, and we all have a range of ways that we might think of modi, um, but when we're seeking well-being, we are seeking a notion of modi order, and that was really inherent to the way in which our tupuna or our ancestors um, arranged ourselves in the, in the way in which tikanga, our knowledge and practices and protocols sought to maintain a sense of modi order uh, and to ensure that through a whole range of ways of keeping balance um, within our communities. And whānau really was central, um, central to that balance. So at the beginning of the paper, we really do start with kind of laying down some quite fundamental, um, quite general comments around whānau as being central to wellbeing, around traditional knowledge as informing us as our relationships to, um, <clears throat> in terms of, those, those concepts of mana atua, mana tangata, mana whenua, uh, and that whānau and whakapapa relationships were central uh, to how we engaged with each other. So I've just returned from it um, now to the notion of historical trauma and the way in which it's been discussed. And really this paper is a kind of definitional paper, so it is around raising the ways in which people have talked about historical trauma. Uh, internationally and here in Aotearoa and in the context of Indigenous people when we talk about historical tra trauma we're talking about the ways in which um, there have been as I've written here a succession of systematic assaults uh, <coughs> that have been perpetrated through colonisation and in and, and many uh, they come in many forms uh, and these are some of those forms that are discussed in the, in the issues paper uh, genocide, genocide being the deliberate and intentional ex uh, attempt to exterminate uh, groups of people. 
So it's a, it's a deliberate, uh, it's really important when we talk about historical trauma that we talk about it uh, as intentional acts. Okay, these are not, this is not a mistake. This is not a trauma that may come from, so an environmental trauma from an earthquake. Okay, they, these are intentional, deliberate, planned, organized, systemic, structured attacks and assaults on groups of people. And for indigenous people, that comes with a wave of colonization. Uh, ethnocide, in terms of the systematic destruction of how we live our lives, of our life ways, of our language, of our cultural frame, frameworks, of our knowledge. Um, <clears throat> forced removal and relocation uh, and a range of different um, mechanisms. And I talk to some, we talked to some of those in the paper. Um, health related experimentation. Uh, and so a lot of that uh, has come in the form of um, the denial or experimentation around reproductive rights, the ability to have children, um, the ways in which native communities and groups of people are experimented on uh, through their lives uh, within the colonial health system. And um, <clears throat> you know, we have some of those experimentation uh, issues here. And we have had for some time, but it's definitely something that goes across Indigenous nations. Uh, and the forced removal and, repla and placement of Indigenous children in particular. So one of the definitions within the definition of uh, the UN definition around uh, genocide is around uh, that particular issue. Um, <clears throat> the removal and placement of Indigenous children outside their communities. Uh, and that has been ongoing and it's something we're seeing now, uh, particularly around uh, the ways in which um, the Ministry of Children have been operating with Māori children uh, over the <coughs> past 30 years uh, and uh, we're hearing more of that coming through the, um, the Commission around state abuse uh, and also we're about to hear more in terms of a Waitangi tribunal claim around the removal of children. <coughs> so Karina Walters talks to historical trauma uh, in this way, and this is in the paper, uh, but she's talking about massive events uh, that target an entire collective. And, and the, <coughs> being really clear about the definition, so we're not talking about um, this, we're not focusing in the historical intergenerational trauma discussion on individuals. It impacts on the individuals. But what we're saying is that this is a deliberate attempt to target a collective. And so it's an ongoing series of events. And colonization, we need to understand, <clears throat> is not a single event. So it didn't just happen, uh, you know, when Cook arrived, arrived 250 years ago. That was an original event an initial event, uh, but colonization is a series of systems and structures that are ongoing and they become embedded uh, <clears throat> in terms of our experience. And Karina, uh, when she writes about it, she talks particularly about the Choctaw Trail of Tears and the removal and displacement of her people. Uh, and so even though she, she may not have experienced it herself, um, the intergenerational impact of that has been seen through their whānau, but also through their nation, uh, the Choctaw nation. <clears throat> then Tessa Campbell gives us some distinguishing features uh, in terms of the experience of Native American uh, and Alaskan Native communities. And, and one is, is that they are widespread, so the impact is widespread, it's a collective impact. Uh, many people within the community are impacted on or affected and affected by the event. Um, two, that they generate high levels of collective distress and mourning within contemporary communities. So it's an intergenerational impact. And three, which is a point I made um, earlier, <clears throat> they are generally purposely perpetrated by outsiders on others with a destructive intent. So they are intentional. Um, Eduardo and Bonnie Duran have written a lot around historical trauma 
uh, within Native communities and in particular the notion of wounding, uh, of a soul wound. And so in this particular quote, Eduardo is talking about both an ancestral soul wounding that has been passed down or has, has had an intergenerational impact uh, upon Native communities and how that came about, but also about the impact of wounding of the earth. And so uh, he speaks to how intentional wounding of the earth is also an intentional wounding of the people who are the kaitiaki or who are the caregivers uh, of the earth. And so soul wounds are not only uh, wounds that we may experience deliberately as humans, but we can experience them through ancestral wounding of our, of our land, of our earth, of our rivers, of our mountains. And so he really has, um, <clears throat> in his work, done the, 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 an analysis that really gives the interconnectedness of all living things, of us as people to our environment <clears throat> and the way in which wounding, both soul wounding and earth wounding, have a particular impact uh, upon us. Then, um, Again, Karina Walters uh, talks about historical trauma in the context of colonial trauma. Uh, and so in many ways, um, the notion of colonial trauma is still being explored as a particular frame of historical trauma. Uh, so if we, um, if we think about historical trauma, what she's saying is that there's a particular way that that impacts on indigenous communities and that the responses uh, need to be thought about in terms of the impact of colonization. And so historical trauma and colonization have to be connected when we're talking about indigenous people. When we're talking about Māori people, Native American, Hawaiian, Aboriginal, a range of indigenous people. There is a historical, generic, general historical trauma discussion Discussion, and then there's the specifics that are about the, our particular experience as Indigenous people on our own lands. Um, which is why in the work that we've been doing with, uh, particularly with Māori health providers and social service providers, um, we've been looking at the relationship of historical trauma and kaupapa Māori. Because at the end of the day, um, we're very aware that until within this country, we move into kaupapa Māori frameworks of healing and that they are validated in the way that they should be validated as healing um, modalities and as ways of engaging with and dealing with uh, the impact of colonial historical trauma. We're going to continue to have, uh, you know, generations of our people that are not getting access to the kind of support and healing uh, that both they desire, but also that they, that we need within our communities. So when we think about historical trauma in Aotearoa, um, there's often a lot of really negative response to our even using the terminology. And we wrote an earlier paper around this, uh, looking at the terminology and the use of the, the framing of historical trauma in Aotearoa. Um, and there's always a very a rapid and intense response to Māori using the word Holocaust. Um, and in 1996, in the Taranaki uh, report, the Waitangi Tribunal stated the Holocaust of Taranaki history and the denigration of the founding peoples in the continuum of 1840 to the present. So they were saying that the this is an ongoing impact, and they use the term Holocaust. Uh, and we also know that when people like Tadia Latudia have used that term uh, in terms of a number of years ago, there was a really rapid response, and she was told not to use the term. Uh, similarly, when, when we look at uh, terminology like genocide and ethnocide. So um, if we're going to look at historical trauma, uh, in a general way, we must look at it in relation to our own history and the ways in which colonization has impacted 
uh, here in Aotearoa. And over the past few weeks, we've seen uh, a number of um, events where uh, there's been a very strong um, articulation of these of the impact of colonization, the impact of historical trauma, uh, and the ways in which it continues to perpetuate uh, structures that are both oppressive and marginalizing of Māori uh, within Aotearoa. And, you know, this is not new. You know, so in 20, uh, you know, here in 2019, talking about this is not new. We're using a particular kind of language to language it when we speak about historical and colonial trauma, which is a relatively new way of framing the language here. Uh, in fact, it's probably been the last 10 years. Uh, and I think in the last five, it's been uh, picked up as a more um, general discourse within the field of dealing with violence and colonization. But, you know, uh, in 1997, Hape here in Waikato wrote a report that raised all of these issues around uh, family violence. And you can see just from this quote from Roma Bowser uh, and the team that wrote that report in 1997, you know, we made links between the denigration of Mana Māori, isolation from ancestral land and cultural practices. The disintegration of social and political structures and the imposition of Western ideologies and practices that play a major role in redefining the position of Māori in the world. So this is, you know, that was a significant piece of work done in 1997. And in many ways, we are continuing to articulate the same arguments in 2019. Uh, because the arguments have yet to be heard, uh, fully, not only by the government, but by many who work in the sector in terms of family violence prevention and intervention. So when we think about historical trauma events, we can, and even, you know, thinking about it here in Aotearoa and more generally, um, Bonnie and Eduardo Duran in their early work talked about a range of events that they could identify very clearly within the native community. Um, the first contact, the impact of first contact. And that impact of first contact, you know, has been a significant issue this year with Tuia 250. Um, and yet on the whole, this country has continued to celebrate that. So, you know, we still have a lot to do around understanding the impact of first contact and the way in which as a particular event that triggered a whole range of other events and other systems and structures uh, that have been uh, incredibly traumatic uh, for Māori um, over the last 250 years. They talk about economic uh, competition and uh, they're really talking about the displacement and disposition of land, confiscation of land. Here in Aotearoa, you know, when we talk about confiscation of land and then Tanaki within, and when we use the Māori concept around that, we talk about muru raupatu. So muru raupatu is often translated as confis uh, confiscation uh, of lands. Actually, muru raupatu means much more than that. The though is hundreds and patu is to be struck. So when our people talk about the disposition of land, we're not talking about just the taking of the land. We're talking about the multiple strikes that our people experience through the disposition of land, through the theft of land, through the confiscation of land, through the disconnection from land. So muru though patu as a term itself indicates to us that there is an ongoing series of traumatic impacts that happen with the disposition of land. Invasion, of which many uh, hapu and iwi have many stories around the impact of invasion into territories, into uh, you know, hapu and iwi territories. Subjugation and reservation, uh, in particular for native people, that was the forced relocation to reservations. Uh, many reservations that operated very similar to concentration camps. And so the resonance between historical trauma theory, 
uh, in terms of the impact of the Holocaust in Germany for Jewish people, uh, that theoretical framework resonates strongly with this kind of analysis around the removal, forced translocation, where many Native people lost their lives and were killed and died in those relocations into reservations. And one of the key points, I think, around this and the relationship to what happened uh, for Jewish people in the Holocaust is that Hitler studied this form of relocation and displacement when he established his extermination policies. So he actually studied what happened with Native people. So there is not a big disconnect between the way in which we talk about these things. Um, boarding school experiences for Native people, particularly the removal and institutionalization of children and the destruction of family and the family unit, uh, and ongoing forced relocation and termination. So these are things that um, Bonnie and Eduardo Duran uh, wrote about a, a number of years ago in their Indigenous Psychologies uh, book that they, that they published. So when we think about these things here in Aotearoa, we're really thinking about um, colonisation as one, a series of histor clearly historical traumatic events. So we can identify as whānau hapan iwi so historical events that impacted significantly on us. So within Taranaki, uh, we can identify Waitara, we can identify Parihaka, uh, Pakakohi, there's a whole range of hapu and iwi experiences that are particular events or series of events around warfare, around invasion, around uh, dispossession. Similarly here in Waikato, similarly in Tuhoi, around the country, uh, every Hapu and Iwi has their stories of particular events. And they collectively impact upon both the present and future generations. Because through those events of disposition and displacement and the imposition or the building of new structures, colonial structures on this land, uh, what we have is an ongoing system and an ongoing series of structures that now reproduces oppression within our channel. So in order to think about historical trauma for Māori, we must see that the intergenerational impacts have their origins in colonial trauma and that they have been embedded through colonization and they continue to be reproduced through systems and through structures within this country. And as I said this week, uh, on, from Monday to Wednesday in Waitara, uh, we had Te Putake o Te Riri. And so, and there is, um, for those of you who are interested in knowing more, there is a public Facebook page that has all of the events and what happened, um, various discussions and panels that were took place over the past few days uh, in terms of this kaupapa. Um, and so what we saw at Te Putake o Te Riri was a gathering of our people in Waitana, uh, both to commemorate the historical and colonial traumas of the land wars and their impact on our people, but also uh, to talk about the current manifestation of that within this generation and a desire and an aspiration for it not to continue into the next generation. So. When we think about historical trauma and when we look, and it's in the, uh, there are a number of examples in the um, issues paper, we are talking about events that within a contemporary experience uh, is a destabilization process. So it's a destabilization of relationships, of knowledge, of language, uh, it impacts and uh, intentionally seeks to break down traditional cultures, to remove the values, to deny sovereignty or tinodanga tinatanga, and the ability for a Māori and Indigenous people to be autonomous in their own lands, to have control over our lives. It interrupts uh, on every level, um, from a macro level, so the bigger societal level, to the micro level, to the whānau level. 
uh, it denies our ability to have the knowledge that we need and the language that we need to raise our children, to parent our children, to be in good relationship with each other. Uh, it changes behaviours. And, and these all happen over an intergenerational process. Okay. So these impacts, it affects our health and well-being. There is a lot of evidence around the way in which stress impacts on our, heart, on our hearts, on our health. And so what we're talking about when we talk about historical trauma is the way in which that is then passed intergenerationally. So after the uh, Christchurch earthquake, there was a lot of discussion that came within the health sector around the increased issues of, of heart, of um, an increased health issues around hearts. So um, people were having more heart attacks in Christchurch. Uh, there were issues around the increase in family violence that happened as a result of that trauma and the stress of that trauma. Uh, the increase in alcoholism, the increase in returning to smoking and cigarettes, all of those things that are stress-related, high-level stress-related issues. So when we think about historical trauma for Māori, you know, one way I think it's really important for us to think about that is when we look at an earthquake and the impact of a singular earthquake event, and actually the ongoing after effects and afterquakes of that event, but an environmental trauma like that, and we can identify very clearly the health impacts, the well-being impacts, the trauma impacts. So if we think about for 250 years, whānau Māori, so Māori people have been experiencing the equivalent of an earthquake every year. That is what we're talking about. That is the level of trauma, that is the level of stress that we're talking about. So if we can see it in an environmental trauma event, then we must be able to open our minds to seeing it in a cultural uh, impact, a knowledge impact, a health impact, of colonial trauma and the ways in which that has worked to, um, to deny Māori the right to live as Māori, to be as Māori, uh, and to have the knowledge and language and cultural frameworks uh, available to us that our ancestors have left to us to help us to inform our relationships in the way in which we are with each other, the way in which we are with others, and the way in which we are uh, with our land and our environment. So one of the things that we talk a little bit about in the issues paper was what are the barriers to, uh, for Māori, to cope up with Māori ways of dealing with these issues. And so these are some of them that we talk about. One is the colonial ideologies and practices that are ongoing. Um, you know, and I really can't, can't stress enough the impact of the Ministry, well, the ministry of Children. And I say the Ministry of Children because the Ōrunga Tamarikin means the well-being of children. And that agency is not an agency of well-being for our children. So in terms of thinking about how we even talk about an agency, I'd really encourage people to not use the Māori term, Māori name, the the Tamari, until such time as that ministry is actually about the well-being of our children. But we see just in, if we just look at that one example, we see uh, this ongoing systemic issue around the removal of Māori children and the destruction of whānau. Um, and the fact that, you know, for over 30 years, that has been documented, uh, both in research and in reviews. So colonial ideolo ideologies and practices, as they continue, Western frameworks dominate uh, within the healing modalities in this country and the ways in which people talk about dealing and healing trauma. Uh, and so covid Māori frameworks are often still marginalised, are still under-resourced, Fana water as a mechanism and a belief system and a practice is a very successful practice, but it's incredibly under-resourced and under-supported and under-validated uh, by, by successful governments. Uh, the continued denial of Māori knowledges, the continued denial of Māori language, the failure to fulfil fundamental treaty obligations and responsibilities on the part of the Crown, and as I said, the failure to um, adequately resource 
uh, Kaupamadi initiatives. So um, this is like one example in terms of how notions of PTSD are talked about within uh, the mental health sector in particular. Uh, and this is from uh, Tessa Evans Campbell, where she, she provides a strong critique of the Western dominance of frameworks in terms of not only in terms of healing uh, and access to resources to healing, but also in terms of diagnosis. Um, and again, we talk in the paper around similarly the notion of the way in which Western knowledge uh, is, dominate, is dominant and creates a whole range of binaries and a whole range of ways of thinking about the world uh, that are not conducive to Māori ways of thinking. Uh, and a lot of this is really uh, grounded in some of the early ethnographical writing, uh, the early colonial writing, where the way in which our ancestors, our tūpuna, talked about our world was realigned to a Western framework okay, of binary opposites, uh, of things like light and dark, of ideas of tapu and noa, sacredness and non-sacred spaces being put in opposition to each other. So a whole range of ways of being of Māori knowledge systems. And uh, this work comes from uh, Tākiri Dangi Smith, uh, and his work um, is referenced in the paper and is also available for, as free downloads on the Chatify site, where he's talking about trauma and how we understand trauma and how we speak about the need to um, rebalance, to seek a way of rebalancing ourselves. And that, that can happen through a whole range of ways. And there are many people doing this. So that's one thing I really want to stress. There are many practitioners, many providers that are working in Māori, you know, in their own Māori models and in Kaupapa Māori models that are doing this work. And part of the, uh, you know, what we are wanting to do is to continue the advocacy for the support and resourcing of that. So when, we, when I talk about things like the Ministry of Children and the way in which uh, things are operating, there's a whole way of, layer of ways in which um, uh, people are operating within that system because they've been trained within a Western framework of social work or a Western framework of counselling. And they think that whānau is family. Well, whānau is not family. Family is an imposed nuclear model. It does not equate or reflect whānau. And so uh, if we're thinking about things like Mātūranga Māori and how do we restore that, then we need to go to Māori providers of social work training. And so we're looking at organisations like Wānanga that ground their work in very deeply uh, sourced Mātūranga Māori and Tikanga Māori models. And, and that is the way in which we need to think about how to move forward. So Mātūranga Māori is really critical. Māori knowledge is, is very critical to uh, a movement forward within the sector to try to you know, create some real and meaningful prevention and intervention in the context of no Māori. And as I said, there are Māori providers that are doing this. Um, the restoration of te oranga te ratanga, the restoration of self-determination, of, of language and voice of tikanga, um, an understanding, a deeper understanding of tikanga practices of well-being, what well-being means, uh, locating our own practices within those frameworks. And so Tākiri Rangi speaks, and there are some in the paper around notions of patu ngāko, understanding trauma as a notion of the beating, and similar to a soul wounding, um, the soul wounding discussion of um, uh, Eduardo Duran and Bonnie Duran, that essence of being, of being beaten, of your whole soul and heart and inner being being beaten. That is trauma. And that the way in which that then impacts on our own whakapapa, how we pass things through generations on our own whānau. So we have practices like modi order, like whānau order, understandings like patungāko, where we can think about trauma and mamai or pain in particular ways and then create 
uh, our own or build on the models that we have because in fact we have really significant models of healing um, of which many of us know Te Whare Tapafa uh, is a tool, Te Whiki is a tool, there are new uh, models that have been coming through uh, in the last few years uh, from people working in historical trauma fields uh, they are really talking about the more balanced and tikanga based ways of healing uh, and practices and the grounding so in the uh, task force on family violence so by kruja and the the group that worked with tamati kruja on that report in 2004 the grounding of healing within tell maori frameworks and that framework has a very clear overview of some of the critical um, elements that are needed in terms of dealing with, with family violence or with family violence um, for Māori and uh, a process of decolonisation that runs alongside the reclamation of our own tikanga and our own leo. So that's what I finish here just to kind of give an indication of um, you know where the work that we're doing uh, and by, by me, I mean, it's uh, with a group of community-based, Māori community-based um, service providers working in the area of whānau violence or prevention and intervention of whānau or sexual violence. Um, <clears throat> we're about to, um, within the next month, uh, release two reports. One is Heo Ngāko, which looks at Māori approaches to trauma-informed care. So it's a very solid critique of the Western framework of trauma-informed care and some understandings from collectors of Māori working um, in healing spaces around Māori approaches. Uh, a report uh, called the Honour Project Aotearoa, which is around takatāpui, so Māori LGBTQI wellbeing uh, and the ways in which takatāpui experience the health sector in particular. We've just released here through, through Tukutahi Research Institute a report that is online on the site called Te Tango Tokungako, which is really a scoping report looking at traditional child rearing and the notion of collective responsibility uh, that is grounded within whānau, both whakapapa whānau and kaupapa whānau, so whānau that come together around particular kaupapa and within communities. Uh, he waka eke noa, which is what we're working with at the moment, um, and it includes uh, four Māori service providers and groups of practitioners uh, looking at, again, Māori frameworks of healing around violence, uh, and a new piece of work that we're doing in Taranaki with Tuta Mohini of Taranaki, uh, which is looking at um, so looking to traditional understandings to move forward and that's around the relationship of healing uh, to land so what is our relationships uh, that we have as people with our environment how do we care for our environment how does our environment care for us um, so those are the, the points that we're moving to uh, now as an extension on this work so, kia ora, kia ora, um, Leone, thank you very much for an incredibly rich presentation, which, and this stuff is just so important, this information is so important for all of us that are working in this area. And I just want to thank you for the way in which you presented this, it makes it very accessible. Um, and I would just like to say um, we look forward to following uh, the work that you your team uh, and you are doing and um, we hope um, that we had an opportunity to share this ongoing work on a, on a regular basis because I think it is incredibly important. Mm -hmm. So once again, thank you. Kia ora. Great, so we've got lots of Comments coming through. Leonie saying, Namihi, and thank you very much, people. Namihi Nui. Learned a lot from the talk. Um, so that's great. Lots of thank yous coming in. This is also everyone's opportunity to ask questions. If you have a question for Leonie, you don't get this opportunity every day. So please do type in your questions, uh, preferably in the 
Q&A button so that we can keep track of them in there. Um, I have one question coming in from a participant around the role of non-Māori practitioners who work in this area of family violence or related areas? Well, you know, everyone needs, uh, in my view, uh, and in terms of any form of healing in this country, I think it's incumbent on everyone to have an understanding of both historical and colonial trauma. Um, and so what that requires is a deeper understanding of the history of this land. And so educating ourselves and educating each other around the history of, our la of the land, um, both generally in terms of Aotearoa, but also in terms of whatever specific region that you're living in. Uh, and that goes across for everybody, in my view. Um, so, <clears throat> and in terms of the kinds of support um, that, well, I'll talk specifically initially about Pākehā, um, uh, practitioners in the field, is actually, there's a whole range of ways that that can be done. There's a whole range of anti-racism work that needs to be done. There's a whole range of work that needs to be done around um, uh, as allies and supporting Māori providers within your region, uh, actively supporting Māori providers within your region um, in terms of supporting in whatever way possible, whether it be through supporting through resourcing, whether it be supporting um, in the challenging of the structures and the systems that exist uh, and the institutional racism, racism that exists. Um, it's, in my view, it's not for non-Māori uh, practitioners to attempt to work in a kaupapa of Māori way. It's for non-Māori practitioners to work in ways that ally and support kaupapa of Māori practitioners uh, that recognise that whānau Māori um, do need to have access to Māori people who have this knowledge uh, and to support the kinds of movements that can create change around historical and the intergenerational impact. So um, supporting history in schools, supporting Māori language being compulsory, um, you know, challenging uh, the systems at, uh, that are at play, um, creating contexts where where they can, and sometimes it is about financial support and resourcing, but people need to speak um, and have meaningful relationships with the providers, kaupapa Māori providers in the area. Because we, we are in a, con you know, this is a context where, you know, it's an industry. You know, this is like, you know, like prisons, you know, there's a whole economic uh, system that is built around uh, trauma and it is built around the impact of trauma on Māori and so you know when we look at incarceration here if we had ways of removing Māori from prisons then the whole prison system would have an issue economically because you know they rely on us in particular privatisation uh, you know, private prisons. And so there's been this whole kind of economic system that has been built around the pain and trauma of our people. Uh, and, and generally, that economic system is not operating to support Māori practitioners. It's operating on the whole, and it's something we've seen in the trauma-informed care discussions we've had with providers, is that what is happening is that in the capture of this new trauma-informed care approach, um, <coughs> and the inclusion of that in contracting for many providers, that, that's been mainly captured by big um, national parkier organisations. Uh, and, and so there's this whole competitive regime that happens in the, within the sector uh, that, that is marginalising of Māori. And so people need to have meaningful, real conversations within the areas that they're in. Uh, with the kind of Māori providers and actually and, and find out how you can support. But without doubt, everyone doing any work in this country, and I mean any work, not just in the family violence, but in education and health and justice, any work needs to uh, get more woke. They need to be, a, you know, be more aware of the history, of the way in which it impacts and of the, and of the ways in which colonisation <coughs> is reproducing, you know, these systems every day. Kia ora. Thank you. I feel like you've articulated that really clearly, both the need for the ongoing education and understanding and then some really concrete ways to um, act and show support and be allies and show up.
Thank you. Uh, related to that, we have another question. Uh, what about white supremacy? It seems to me this is heavily implicated in our social science and social services. Is it helpful for us to be explicit about this? Is it helpful for us to be? To be explicit about this. I oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> we know that white supremacy is alive and well in this country and is ga gathering uh, and, y you know, we may like to, you know, people may like to put some blinders around that, but, uh, you know, white supremacy, the whole construct of racism is built on the notion of supremacy and it's built on the notion of hierarchy. And it's built on, on the reproduction of racial uh, and you know privilege and of white privilege and so absolutely um, we, it needs to be explicit and it needs to be explicit in a conversation of colonization as well because white you know where there's a fundamental notion of racism um, <clears throat> racism is often built around that kind of biological color you know, notion when we start talking about racism here, we're also talking about, uh, you know, we're talking about indigeneity, which is not necessarily, um, you know, there's a complexity to notions of racism. When we're talking about indigeneity, we're talking about disposition of land and colonization and capitalism in a way that, so, you know, all the multiple ways that it plays itself out. Um, <clears throat> but yes, uh, an awareness of colonization, uh, an awareness of historical trauma, oppression, uh, and awareness of the importation of colonial ideas and beliefs and practices and their forced uh, imposition on Māori people means that we must have an awareness of white supremacy. Kia ora. That's, that's great. That's really clear. Thank you. Okay, we've got, um, I realise it is after 11.30 here, so if people do need to go, we understand. Uh, we, we will just keep going a little bit longer while there are more questions coming in. Uh, we have a couple of Similar questions here from people. Um, as, as a co of Māori service, working to keep our tamariki with Fano, it's very challenging with Oranga Tamariki or the Ministry for Children. Uh, with limited resources, what would you recommend as some, uh, some positive ways that our mahi can continue to mahitaki with Fano? How can we uh, better support Fano who are going through Ministry for Children processes? Yeah, well, you know, the Ministry for Children, and, and I really do mihi to all of those um, <clears throat> providers that are challenging the Ministry and that are walking alongside whānau uh, in terms of their interactions with the Ministry, because the Ministry is a very punitive organisation. Uh, and, and for those people who are watching this who are social workers in the Ministry, but I'm not talking about individuals, I'm talking about as a, as a system and as a structure the ministry has been set up to remove children. Uh, and so for those who are working both inside and outside to, to continue the well-being and to ensure the well-being of tamariki within the whānau context, you know, we just, you know, we see it every day. We see that work being done every day. And, you know, I would just say continue doing the work you're doing. Uh, continue to advocate for whānau in the way that you advocate. I know that there is, when people have talked to us about having whānau navigators or having, uh, you know, whānau members or people with them, walking with them alongside that, um, the issues uh, that are coming up within the, with them, with the ministry, uh, that having that advocate is really important. So continuing to be advocate, advocates in that system. Um, but also, I think particularly at the moment, uh, with the tribunal claim that has now uh, been given um, urgency and will be heard um, relatively soon, I would hope, um, <clears throat> that there are lawyers and that there are whānau and there are people that are going through that process. And I think that's a process that as many people who are working in the, in the area, you know, if you can engage in it, be a part of it, sit in it, network in it, I think that's really really important. Um, but as long as we're continuing to keep whānau well-being at the centre, uh, what we know with the uh, many of the experiences of uplifts of Māori children is that whānau are not included and so we, those whānau need to have strong advocates that continue to be there 
uh, on their behalf and with them. Kia ora. Thanks, Leonie. Okay, we have another question here. Are iwi training their whangai whanau in the Māori <coughs> trauma-informed approach to increase the healing experiences of children that can't live with their first families? Can you repeat that? Sure. Uh, mm. Are iwi training their whangai whanau in the Māori trauma-informed approach to increase the healing experiences of children who can't live with their first families? Uh, are we training people working in this area? I say, well, it's, cause I'm not sure what's meant by whānau. Yeah. Whānau. Um, because whānau is not foster and whānau is not adoption. Whānau is whānau. Uh, <clears throat> and so I think if we're talking about are we training, uh, are we training people who are working as caregivers, um, you know, that's something that I, I'm not... I know that there are organisations, more Māori providers that we've been working with, that are doing that. Uh, whether iwi as a whole are doing that, um, it's not something that I'm totally aware of in, in terms of, we have had discussions with iwi, uh, a number of iwi around the work and, and what we're doing and how we can support them. Uh, but in terms of the training of caregivers, I think that's very varied across the country at the moment. And then one of the things that it's really, uh, you know, become even more and more aware of as we're working with Māori providers is that when, the, when they are <coughs> dealing with whoever the contractor is, whether it be a DHP or a justice or whatever, when, when those organisations as funders talk about trauma-informed care, they're not talking about kaupapa Māori. And so often those providers and those you know, those service providers and healers are having to speak back to a definition of trauma-informed care that is not inclusive of a kaupapa Māori way of being, which is really what uh, raised the project that we have been doing here in Ngāka, uh, because Māori uh, working in the sector have been saying, whenever this comes up, it's a very Western model, it's a very individualistic model. It's a very much about only about current and present trauma. There's no historical trauma analysis and there's no far no context analysis. You know, so um, <clears throat> it's something that, uh, you know, given that various trauma event, historical trauma events, uh, do have different ways of manifesting. So the experience of Tanaki is different to the experience of Waikato. And, and uh, you know, it's different to Ngāti Pilo and it's different to Tūhoi. So where there are structures that we're all living under in terms of colonial structures of government, government or kāwanatanga, um, that we're all living under, we also have our own specific hapu and iwi experiences that we need, and tikanga, the ways of being that we need to bring forward. And so we're not advocating that there's a one-size-fits-all, even within kaipapa. Māori. It's an umbrella term, but really we need to think carefully about our own experiences and <clears throat> the ways in which they have impacted on us. So, you know, Tuia 250 is very clear. When Cook arrived uh, in Tairawhiti, the experience of that was different to our experience in Taranaki. But similarly, when, land, when the land wars began in Waitara and the very first shot was taken on March 17th in 1860, in, in that territory, that changed our entire experience as a iwi. Um, <clears throat> so I guess what I'm saying is, um, this is something that we need to also work in, uh, in a hapu and iwi way, in a whānau way. Kia ora. Great. Okay, we have a question here about um, as a Māori kaimahi working in a Methodist NGO, how could we implement changes to develop, deliver in a kaipapa Māori way of healing? We have the knowledge and we have the endorsement of the organisation. The barrier is we're not a kaipapa Māori provider, we're Māori, but we are Māori working with Māori. Mm. Yeah, that's always an, <coughs> an interesting question. And, and I think a lot of organisations, Māori within mainstream organisations are grappling with that. Uh, question and 
<clears throat> I mean, my, my initial response is, Kaipapa Māori is defined and controlled by Māori within Māori context, within Māori control. And so <clears throat> when we're talking about Kaipapa Māori, we're also talking about this notion of uh, you know, the principle of te rodanga tiratanga, which is a principle of self-determination. Can you be self-determining inside a mainstream organisation as a Māori person? Well, no, we can't. Uh, I mean, that's very clear. And so <clears throat> what does that mean? It doesn't mean we can't practice as Māori people. It just means that we can't assert te rodanga tiratanga when we're under the governance of somebody else. So that raises a whole range of questions around how is Māori in these organisations uh, can you see a way forward? So go, the question goes back to the person, really. Can you see a way forward to the establishment or the embedding of te rodanga tiratanga uh, in your space? Um, <clears throat> is there an openness to a meaningful and real treaty relationship where a kaupapa Māori um, organisation grows out of the Māori workers in that organisation and has ranga tiratanga and is autonomous? And still can be supported by the other, you know, by the mainstream organisation as an ally. But one of the things that we've been uh, seeing more and more is even things like government agencies saying that, that they are operating in a kind of a Māori way. Well, we need to be very clear. Government agencies are kāwanatanga. Kaupapa Māori, so that's governance. Kaupapa Māori asus rangatiratanga. That's self-determination. So government departments cannot cannot lead out Kaupapa Māori. And mainstream organisations that are based within Western frameworks, Haka frameworks, cannot lead out Kaupapa Māori. That, that's not denying the amazing work that Māori workers do inside organisations. And we may, you know, within a mainstream organisation, we may be able to do five of the six principles. You know, we may be able to support whānau, we may be able to work in pedagogical ways or practice ways that are Māori. Uh, but that sixth principle, the principle of te rodanga tiratanga, that is what ultimately makes us a kaupapa Māori service uh, in terms of how we operate. So it's really thinking around what does that mean uh, for, for us within the organisations that we're sitting within. And that's something that I you know, have to work with myself, you know. Uh, working within a mainstream university or working within you know a mainstream organization like Unitech. Uh, and so you know how does that work in terms of working in mainstream organizations? And part of you know my way of resolving that uh, more, most recently has been to ensure that I have a whole part of my time where I am totally autonomous and I have total control uh, and I'm self-determining with the people that I work with. Um, and can work with allies, but my, my work is not driven by allies, yeah. Great, thank you. I think you've made those mm. distinctions really clear and put out some good questions for people to, to, think, to think through, so that's great. Okay, we have a question here. I know that the Ministry of Children is putting a lot of resources and training into trauma-informed care. Has there been, to your knowledge, any attempt to made to work alongside and with your work about trauma, your work about trauma-informed care? Do you think that they will pick up your research and mahi in this area? So no and no. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm aware of that. I'm aware of the incredible amount of resourcing that's gone into a failing uh, ministry uh, and the systems that continue to reproduce bad outcomes. Uh, so, and uh, I'm, I'm aware that there is um, trauma-informed care approach, but it's a very Western approach. It's very much about family, not about whānau. It's very individualistic. Um, so all of the things that we know uh, dominate uh, the kind of Western paradigm of that thinking. And so, um, yes, uh, we have talked to a number of Māori uh, social workers and, and kaimahi and you know, workers in, in the ministry. Um, a number have attended seminars and symposiums where we've raised these issues. I mean, uh, collectively, I mean, we collectively, different community organisations and um, Māori providers. And uh, to my knowledge, there has not been, well, there's definitely not been any approach to anyone that I'm aware of. 
um, I, ne I don't have any Māori social workers who are working in this field out or counsellors or providers who are working in communities um, say that they've ever been approached by the ministry to do any training or have any input. Um, so, uh, yes, I'm, I'm not aware of any, um, and definitely uh, the ministry has not made any meaningful approach to anyone that I know who's doing this work outside of the people that work for them. Mm. Yep. Kia ora. Okay, I think, well, you've given people, certainly anyone who is wanting to learn more about this work and learn more about how to challenge and decolonise the systems and structures that we live under, a lot of information, a lot of places to go to keep um, learning and challenging and undoing and those, yeah, all the, the work that needs to be done. So, yeah, that's, uh, thank you for your generosity and your time in answering those questions there. Yes, okay, I think it, it really is time to let Leone go. Um, I'm sure we could uh, be here for, you know, another half a day. Um, and once again, uh, Leone, this has been a wonderful way to kick off our um, webinar series, which we hope is going to be a series. We trust it's going to be a series. I can't think of a better um, way to start. So thank you very much indeed. And I'm making you to everyone who's joined us today. I think it is also a testament to um, Leone that we've had very few people drop out. I mean, people have other obligations, but here we are and we've still got over 100 people um, with us. So again, once again, thank you all. And thank you for your, your really thoughtful questions. And we trust that you got um, a lot out of this and you'll take this away and use it um, to inform your work. Matewa. Just to echo what Robin said, Tene te mihinui ki a koutou katoa, uh, ka mihinui ki a koe leoni. Nō reira, mauri ora ki a tātou, ki ora tātou. Kia ora. Ena koutou. <laughs>